episode 47. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host as we listen to eyewitness encounters involving one of the most terrifying cryptids, Dogmen. Our guest tonight is Joel Harvey. Joel, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Vic. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I am 30 years old. Uh, I live in a suburb of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I grew up um, hunting and fishing. Uh, My family owns a a pretty good-sized deer lease about two and a half hours south of here in uh, Brownwood, Texas. And uh, I've I've been out there my whole life. I've I've been into sports. Uh, I am former military. And uh, that's... That's about it. Uh, I went to to college and played a little football at Texas Tech University, and uh, now I work as a personal trainer uh, here in uh, Frisco, Texas. You've got a really interesting background with a lot of things that wouldn't be evident unless you did some digging. Along those lines, you've got some serious experience in the woods. Please tell us about that. Uh, well, I've 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 hunted all all my life. Um, I mean, everything from, from bird to deer to, I've hunted hogs with, with dogs and, and knives and fish. My, my uncle, uh, actually, I'm, I'm not going to give his name away, <laughs> but, uh, he's actually a big time game warden down here. And, uh, I've had a lot of time to kind of hunt with him and then learn from him. And so we, we've been out in the woods, you know, as long as I can remember. And, uh, I've hunted just about everything there is to hunt in Texas. You know, even as a small child, I would, I'd go out in the woods and, and just kind of sit there and, and, <laughs> and just kind of become one with nature. I like, when I go out hunting, I like to kind of just go out there and, and sit and then kind of let everything settle down, kind of get quiet and kind of just become one with nature. The more you can calm yourself down, the more nature will spring back to life and you can, you can just kind of enjoy it. A lot of times I won't even hunt. I'll, I just enjoy watching the wildlife. That's one thing I like to do, and and um, I, I I really know how to hunt just about every everything from coyotes to to, to big game to to the small game, and um, and I love it. It's, it's what I do. Having spent so much time in the wilderness, what was the strangest thing until now that you had seen? <sighs> that's uh that's kind of difficult. Um, I mean. It, I've seen some strange stuff. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how 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 strange or you know out there you want me to get here, but uh, I have seen uh, a couple UFOs. Um, I don't know if that was you know you want me to get into that, but um, down at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, actually, um, we were on just a uh, a ruck march, and I looked up in the sky and and. You know, was, was seeing, and me and a couple of buddies were seeing these things fly up over our heads. And I asked the drill sergeant, hey, you know, what, what is that? And he's like, oh, uh, uh that's, that's just satellites. Maybe it was, I, you know, I, I never got confirmation of what it was, but, um, it didn't, I didn't know you could see satellites with, with the naked eye. Maybe you can. Maybe you can help me with that. No one's been able to really tell me. But these things were moving pretty fast. I thought if they were satellites, they'd be so far up there that you wouldn't be able to see them just moving across the sky like they were. As far as just strange things in the woods, though, up until now, I had never really seen any anything too out of the ordinary. Most of it's been, you know, when I've gone out late at night, it's, you know, I've whatever we were calling, whether it be coyotes or, or, or foxes, you know, drawing them in with, with a, you know, dying varmint call. We would see what we wanted to see. We didn't, I didn't see anything that was too strange. Um, I, I've had some other experiences that were, were pretty strange, but um, nothing like this last one. After that strange encounter that morning on the deer lease, you can't say that anymore. That was pretty strange, to say oh, the yeah. least. <laughs> Talk about the strange things that can happen to you in the woods. I know you're a former airborne, so that coupled with all of your hunting experience and other time just loitering out there in the woods, I know you've had some strange things that might not have involved seeing them, 
but some other way you knew that something strange was going on. Well, you know, you we'd be out in the woods and you would hear, you know, animals. I mean, I, you know, all my time in the woods, I could usually pinpoint what I would hear. I, I could usually, you know, make out what it was. And most of the time it'd be pigs or, you know, sometimes you'd hear some kind of cat or something like that. But we'd always be able to see, you know, maybe some tracks or, you, you know, pigs are real, you know, they make a sound that, you know, that grunt, that little pig grunt, that you, you know, you know it's pig. You can hear them squealing and running around. Um, and, you know, we hear those all the time. But usually, you know, when you're out walking around with a bunch of people, animals tend to to run away. Um, so you, most of the things I've heard, and, and down on the deer leash, um, we've got coyotes all over the place. And uh, you hear those hunting at night, and that's, they make some pretty strange sounds when they get it killed. There's some pretty, pretty strange sounds, but you know, I've grown up hearing that. And so, you know, I've, I've always been able to, to know that, you know, whatever I was hearing, I could, I wasn't too put off by it because I knew what it was coming from most of the time. So yeah, up, up until now, I, I haven't really heard much in the woods that I didn't know what it was because I've, you know, like I said, I've, I've grown up in the woods and hunted my whole life, and I, I knew what, what all that stuff was. Before this encounter you had, what were your thoughts about the existence of creatures like Dogman or Bigfoot? Uh, well, you know, I, I didn't, <laughs> I mean, I had heard of Bigfoot, you know, obviously, but I had never put much thought into it. Never, I, I remember when I was younger, I had watched some documentary on that, the Patty, um, What's um that patty that suit that's supposedly you know I guess it wasn't a suit <laughs> now that I've been looking looking at it a little more closely there's just no way that could have been a suit but uh, I had chalked that up to just a suit you know some guys put together so just you know because that's what the documentary told me so I just you know believed that and um, that's that was that for me I you know just figured if if Bigfoot was in the woods I would have seen him by now. Or I would have, I would have met someone that had, that had seen him and, uh, that hadn't happened. So I just figured, you know, that was all just kind of tall tales or, you know, stories or just, I didn't think that that was, uh, that that was a reality. Your encounter happened on your family's deer lease in Texas, as you said. Please tell us about that deer lease so we can get an idea of what the layout of the land was like. Yeah, it's um it's about a little over 3000 acres. Uh it's got two big old fish tanks on it. Um stocked with bass and we're always out there fishing. Uh the the layout it's it's slightly hilly, um mixed in with some kind of flat flat land. Uh but it is kind of going down in the south uh Texas kind of I mean it's about two and a half hours south uh of Dallas on Highway 67. And it gets a little more hilly out there and, and real beautiful, uh, a lot of mesquite trees, real thick, you know, once you get off the trails and kind of get into it, it, it's a little thicker. But yeah, that's that's about the layout. You said there are a lot of mesquite trees in that part of Texas. Is there a lack of tall trees? Is it almost all, if you do have trees, almost all lower type trees like those mesquites or what? They are a little lower. The tallest ones may be 15, 20 feet tall, but it can get pretty thick with all the brush. And we have a whole lot of hogs on the property, and they'll run through this tall kind of grass. Like if you've seen uh, that first Jurassic Park, <laughs> I've hunted hog, and you're wa- you're kind of wading through this grass, and you just hear these hogs just, you know, they, they make these little tunnels through the grass, and you can just hear them just shooting in and out <laughs> behind you and in front of you. And, it's pretty, I mean, it's it's thick enough to where, you know, you can't see everything going on, but it's not, um, it's not, it's no jungle, you know, or anything like that. It's it's relatively open, um, so it, it does provide uh, more visibility than, than like a dense jungle or, or something like that, but it, it's uh, pretty much just like, yeah, open kind of forest. If you want to hide, sounds like a really good place to do that. All right, Joel, please tell us about your encounter. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. We went down on a Friday to the deer lease. It was uh, me and my dad, and we were meeting my cousins, and 
and everybody for a for a hunt. It was uh, January. It was the end of um, the very end of deer season, and um, we hunted Friday night and uh, saw all kinds of things. Saw you know, I mean, there was quail. We saw a couple hogs. We saw maybe ten, fifteen deer in the pen. I mean, that's usually pretty normal. Uh, we, we've just got deer all over the place. Um, we didn't shoot anything, you know, we had a couple of days to hunt and we had, you know, it was the end of deer season. So we were actually, we were looking for that big buck and really my dad was, he, I, I had shot a buck and, um, it was his turn, you know, to shoot a buck. So we were waiting for that perfect deer. Um, so we didn't take anything Friday, Saturday, woke up, hunted in the morning, hunted in the afternoon, same thing, tons of wildlife, birds, chirping, you know, squirrels, deer, I mean, just every, everything you could see. Went to bed that night, nothing too out of the ordinary. Now, I did bring, um, and I don't know if this will play into it at all, but I did bring my uh, AR-15 down, and uh, just one, it was a new one I would bought, and I just kind of wanted to run it and just see how it did. And so uh, right outside our camp, there's this big kind of incline where you can kind of shoot into this hill. And so we were just kind of shooting this AR as fast as we could, you know, just seeing, you know, if there were any jams or anything like that that would happen. And, uh, it went, it ran smooth and, you know, I don't know if that caught anything's attention or anything. Um, but also that night, Saturday night, we had heard some coyotes and that's normal, uh, on our lease. We've got coyotes all over the place and, um, they were just going nuts when they're out hunting and they catch something, they start howling and going crazy. And, um, so we heard all that going on Saturday night and that was cool. You know, I was like hearing the coyotes. And then we uh, woke up Sunday morning. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Before I get into Sunday morning, uh, we we still hadn't gotten anything in the afternoon. We hunted about the feeders will go off in our pen at, uh, I believe, I want to say like 6.45 a.m. And then again at like 3.45 p.m. And uh, we hadn't gotten anything Saturday on both hunts. So we really wanted to get something Sunday. So we had we had gotten two big old bags of corn, and just and the feeders throw corn anyway. But we we just really wanted to draw something in. So we got two big old bags of corn and just started kind of pouring it all around um, the uh, the feeder, the, the the pen, and just all over all over the you know the area. And uh, so there was just tons of corn sitting out there. So we we thought we definitely you know if that buck was out there, we we'd find it. And, uh, so we get there Sunday morning and how, how it works is we'll, we'll drive up and we'll park the truck, uh, maybe about a half a mile, maybe a little more, um, away from the pen, uh, from the, from the blind. This way we can walk up, you know, our lights and everything don't scare off any, any game in the area. And, uh, so we're, we'll park the truck and we're walking up and, um, uh, I got the rifle in my hands. It's a, a 270, uh, Remington. And my dad's walking slower, about, I'd say, probably 15 yards behind me. I don't know how, you know, he walks so slow, but I guess I'm a fast walker or whatever. And um, so we're walking, and we get about halfway there, maybe about three-fourths of the way to the blind. And um, all of a sudden, a rock comes in and hits right at my feet at about, I mean, this thing came in at 100 miles an hour, and I jumped up in the air. Literally, I came about a foot and a half, two feet off the ground, and just swung my rifle in that direction, and was just stood, you know, just, just, you know, just shocked, just staring there, you know, I mean, because this wasn't, I mean, this rock came in and hit so hard, this wasn't like I had you know, scared a deer or an animal, and they had kicked up some rocks, and some, you know, it wasn't the sound of a rock kind of bouncing off the ground. I mean, this was the sound of something that had been thrown very hard and cracked like a gunshot at my feet. I mean, it was loud. So I spun around and I, I looked and I, you know, I didn't see anything because basically we're walking on these, um, these, uh, paths, you know, that our trucks can get through and it's just wide enough to get the truck through. And then when you look to the sides, there's just no visibility at all. It's all just brush and it's covered up pretty good. So I turned around and looked at my dad and just, you know, and I'm trying to whisper, trying to just, you know, keep calm. And I was like, did you, you know, did you hear that? 
and uh, he just kind of, he's, you know, moseying along. I think he was a little, you know, hungover from the night before or whatever. And he, you know, he was just like, no, no, you know. He, apparently he didn't he didn't hear it. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I really don't know how that's possible. But uh, he didn't hear it. And so I just, you know, I just kind of turned back around and, and started walking. I just chalked it up to, well, it must have been something that just, you know, who knows. <laughs> I, you know, something just kicked kicked the rock my way or whatever. Um, the more time I've had to think about, though, there's just no possible way that the rock was kicked you know by a deer running or anything like that it was just it was just too loud it was thrown too hard and it was just right at my feet I mean the crack went off like a firecracker right at my feet so um, we keep walking and we get to the blind and uh, we climb up in the blind and um, we're sitting there the sun's still down uh, there's there's no visibility at this point and Usually what I like to do is just put my head down on the front of the blind and I'll just sleep and I'll wait for my dad or whoever I'm with to nudge me when they see some activity and I'll peek my eyes up and I'll, you know, start scanning and, and looking, you know, whatever there is. So I'm sleeping and uh, my dad nudges me and uh, he's like, Joel, Joel, you know, so I, I look up and I start looking and I'm like, what? you know, what, what is that? And, and my dad's like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, now he saw this and we're sitting there staring with just these blank faces. You know, we can't make out what these things are. And by this time, the sun is starting to come up. It hasn't peaked up over the ridge or anything like that. There's no sunlight, but it's kind of gray out. You know, it's, it's dusk. It's, it's before, you know, the sun hits. So there's a little bit of visibility. Basically, what we saw were these four things kind of running around on all fours in and around the the feeder pen. And uh, we just couldn't figure out. We don't have, in Texas, we don't have black panthers. We don't have bears. The closest thing we got to anything like that are mountain lions, which are, they're like a beige color. You know, you, they're they're not black. And these things were, were black, black. I mean, they were, they were blacker than, I mean, I'm, you know, they're just darker than, than night. I mean, it was, it was, you know, I, I've listened to some shows now and, um, I've heard people talk about this color and, and it's kind of hard to explain because I've seen a lot of black things in my life, but this, this was definitely, um, black. I mean, it was, <laughs> anyway. They were real dark. It was hard to, to really see, but I did get a, a good, you know, the, the, their shapes, you know, the silhouettes. I could see how they were moving. And so we're staring, and we're kind of going back and forth talking, and, you know, my dad's like, well, you know, maybe they're raccoons. And uh, I'm thinking, like, you know, there's, I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, but our, our blind, how it sits, it's elevated, so we're, it's kind of a, you climb a little ladder up and it sits about maybe eight, ten feet, something like that off the ground. And it's about a 70 yard shot, um, slightly downhill into a, uh, kind of a little clearing. And I know the, the, the size, you know, from that, you know, I know how big things are. Raccoons are a lot smaller than these things were. Now these weren't huge. I would say that they were about, three feet tall and maybe about four, maybe five feet long. They weren't big. They, I mean, they weren't, they, they were, they were bigger than raccoons. They were easily three times the size of raccoons, but they weren't, they weren't enormous creatures. So, you know, we're sitting there looking and, and my dad's sitting there thinking of raccoons. I'm just telling him like, you know, that, that those aren't raccoons, you know? So I was just praying that the sun would come up and I could get a good, a real good look at, at, at these things and, you know, and find out what it, what they were. So before I got that chance, they had, and they had kind of scattered off into the tree line on the right. And just before I get into kind of what else happened, um, the way they were moving was just incredible. I mean, it was just so fluid and so, the closest thing I could describe it to would be like a cat, kind of the way a cat would move. But I would go so far as to say that it was even 
smoother. I mean, it was it was more fluid. I mean, these things were going up and over. I mean, it couldn't have been a raccoon just based on, I know how raccoons move, and they'll eat, and they'll use their hands, and they'll climb up the feeder, and they'll sit there and, and reach in there with their hands and pull corn out of the feeder with their hands and just eat and sit on the pen, and they'll, you know, they're, they're small, so they can they can sit on things, and 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 these weren't doing that. These were too big to sit on on the on the barbed wire fence, you know, the pin, and they were too big to hang and and reach their hands, and they weren't really using their hands. But the way they were jumping over the uh, the pin was like, I mean, it was just so fluid. I just I've never seen. I don't even think a cat. I don't think a, a panther or anything could move like that. So I was just fascinated. We're just sitting there with our jaws open, looking at this, with no explanation, just hoping that the sun and they would hang around. And I was looking through my scope and, and just trying to really, you know, so I had a bead on these things. But, you know, we don't shoot, you know, how we hunt and how I was raised. You know, we don't shoot unless we know what we're shooting at. You don't do that. So I wasn't going to shoot, but I, I wanted to get a good view of these things. and. um I just couldn't, I just didn't get a good enough view. And before, before I could make out anything as the sun was coming up, they all scampered off into the tree line on the right. And so I was just kind of like, oh, well, shoot, you know, maybe they'll come back. Um, so we're sitting there and, uh, there's absolutely no activity at all. And the, the previous two days, like I said, we had seen tons of deer. We had seen pheasant. We'd seen all kinds of stuff. We just wildlife everywhere, and and the amount of corn we had thrown, there was just no explanation for why there wouldn't be any wildlife in the area. There's just, I mean, we hadn't done anything different. We had put more corn down, and no one had shot anything. Sometimes when you shoot something, the animals in the area will kind of, you know, they'll they'll scatter off and they won't come back to that area for a few days, a week, or whatever. We hadn't shot anything. We hadn't disturbed the area. You know, everything was normal, so we were just kind of perplexed. I didn't even, I mean, in thinking about it, too, I, I thought it was strange at the time because there were all these little, we were looking at these little bright red birds that were in the area. I forgot what they were called, but they're really bright red birds, and we were looking at them. We, we thought they were cool, and they they weren't even there that day, you know, so it was real strange. It was real calm in the woods. There was no sign of life at all. And we're sitting there, and we, you know, we still don't see anything. Um, and maybe about, you know, the feeder goes off, still nothing. Um, and so we're sitting there, and then all of a sudden, a deer comes walking out from the left side of the clearing from the tree line. And this thing, I've seen a lot of spooked deer in my life. Hunting my whole life, you just, during deer season, deer they know what's going on they know they're being hunted and they're scared you know they're 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 on edge and um this thing though was this thing was more than scared this thing was terrified and not only was it just terrified it was panting like it had been running for 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 its life I mean, its stomach was going up and down, just trying to get oxygen, just trying to... And not only that, it was kind of stumbling, like it had hurt its leg or something during the run. It was just the oddest... I've never seen a deer act like this before. And so the deer kind of came out of the clearing and just panting, breathing. It was just terrified. So I'm just looking at it like, okay, well, here we go. So I got my gun up, and I'm looking at this thing, and, and I just... Didn't know what to think about all this, so I'm just kind of going with the flow. And it's panning, and this thing was so spooked, it was looking off to the right where those creatures had run off into the tree line, and it would look back left where it had come back out. Look back right, look back left, look back. I mean, that's all it was doing the whole time. It wasn't interested in the corn. We weren't making any noise. I don't think it knew we were there, but it just seemed to be more occupied. It wasn't worried about the corn. It was just worried about what was in the tree line to the right and what was in the tree line to the left. And that was all it was worried about. And it just kind of puttered around, kind of back and forth, just kind of just incredibly out of breath for about 15 minutes or so until it kind of just stumbled off back to the tree line left where it came from. Really strange kind of behavior from this deer. 
And so we're like, maybe it'll come back. You know, it was still, the light was just about hitting now. The sun was just coming up now. And so this deer kind of, you know, we got a good make on the deer, and, and it, it kind of walked back off, stumbled back off. And then <laughs> what kind of got me really thinking about all this was this fox that came up. Now, this fox had come up. Our blind, like I said, is elevated. We have windows all around the blind, so we got 360 degrees of vision around the blind. So this fox comes up under our blind, trots underneath, walks about 15, 20 yards, and sits. And if you know anything about foxes, they're probably one of the most elusive creatures there are. You just you won't see a fox. Even when you're hunting a fox and you're calling them in, they'll keep their distance. They're, they're very good sense of smell. They're very cautious. They're little, you know, they're maybe 25, 30 pound animals. They're not big, so they're very weary of anything. This fox was calmer than any any fox I'd ever seen in my life. It went, sat down. Literally, it was kind of looking up at us. Not quite, but it, it kind of was acknowledging that we were there and it was just had its mouth open, just, just had, it was like it had a big smile on its face. Just kind of, I mean, and, and it was kind of like it was hunting, kind of like it was stalking something because it would sit there. It was just calm. It didn't care about anything, <laughs> you know, and it kind of got up and kind of started trotting low, kind of low to the ground, kind of like it was stalking, and then it kind of go and sit back down and kind of roll on its side and just kind of sit there, and and then it kind of get up and, and do the same thing again, and, and so I'm just sitting here staring at this fox, just wondering why, you know, and at this point, I have my head, like, peeked out, because I'm interested, I, I don't know why this fox is kind of acting like this, so I, I have my head outside the feeder, and I'm kind of looking at it, and I got my, my rifle, you know, right there with me, and I'm just kind of staring at it, trying to see if I can scare it or what's what's the deal with this thing. And it just pays me no mind. It just kind of it's doing it. So it's in its whole own world. So I just figured, okay, whatever. We're waiting on deer, so you know I'll, I'll be quiet. I'll get back in the, the blind here, and and we'll just wait on a deer. Nothing showed up. Nothing at all after that fox had left, and he sat around again for about 15 minutes or so. And then he was gone. He ran off in the tree line to the right where those creatures had run. So we're sitting there. We don't see anything. We wait. We wait. Sometimes we'll wait till 9, 30, 10 o'clock. We waited till about 9, 15, 9, 30, something like that. We get out of the blind. We're like, okay, we'll just chalk this up to a loss. There's just nothing going on today. Maybe we have a lot of uh, surrounding kind of where our blind is. It's kind of near this road. And across the road, there's a guy that owns a lease next to us and they hunt a lot too and I figured maybe he had shot something the day before who knows and kind of scared all the wildlife in the area I didn't know what to think so um, we get out of the blind and we start walking back to the truck just like any other time just normal and again I'm out in front of my dad and all of a sudden I get this dreadful feeling I mean I, I I'm pretty sensitive to that and I know this wasn't and then this was definitely something external making this I didn't know whether it was in the spirit realm I didn't know whether it was a physical entity looking at me I was thinking at the time maybe a mountain lion but all I knew was that something was staring into my soul was really trying to <laughs> was I was eyeballing me so I'm scanning I'm scanning and I keep and I remember I was worried about my dad because I know I'm, I'm a little more perceptive of these things than he is. And so I'm looking back and making sure he's keeping up because I'm the only one with the rifle. I walk a little faster than he does. He's about 15, 20 yards behind me again. And so I just keep looking back, and he's just not keeping up. So I'm I'm walking about 15 yards, stopping, waiting. And, and I start getting this feeling coming over me that's just, you know, it's just brutal. Just a brutal, horrible fear. And so I start saying, I'm, you know, I'm a Christian and I start saying the Lord's Prayer. And it, you know, it starts subsiding. The fear starts kind of going away. But it wasn't after it, it kind of probed my soul that that fear had started to drop. And I started saying the Lord's Prayer that it kind of started to drop. 
now I know that this happened. I can't, it's kind of, it was such a, for me, it, it was such a kind of a, you know, I wasn't thinking, you know, I, I didn't know anything about Dogman. I didn't know much about cryptids. But on the way back, and I don't think I had told, I had thought about this after we had our pre-interview, but we did see a track, <laughs> uh, on the, on the road back. And I don't know if it was, um, I think it had rained a few days earlier, so I don't know if this was a fresh track. Now, all the time I've spent in the woods and, and, and other things, I, you know, I had never really gotten much into tracking. I mean, I know a little bit about covering your tracks and, you know, walking in a straight line, everyone, you know, walks on the same tracks and stuff like that, but I had never gone out and tried to identify tracks. I just, something that I just never got into, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of more of a city boy and, I do go down to the woods a lot, you know, my whole life I've done it, but I've never, you know, lived out, you know, I've just, I haven't completely lived that lifestyle to where I could point at a track and say, oh, that's this, that's this, that's, you know. Um, but what it looked like, what me and my, and I remember asking my dad, I brought him over and, and looked at it, it was, you know, and it looked like a big mountain lion track. That's what we had chalked it up to at the time, was, uh, you know, a big old mountain lion paw you know i mean it was uh it was probably the size of my hand my hand fully extended out and it had i, I mean I, I wish i would have taken a picture of it or something i just wasn't thinking of anything like that so and i brought my dad over. i was like what is that i was like that must be a mountain because we're always hoping we see a mountain lion we had just chalked up this print but thinking about it and I wish I, I it's it's hard for me to really remember what this print looked like all I know is that this happened I, I can't tell you exactly what the print looked like but I know it was some kind of to me it looked like a cat print again it could have been a big wolf print but we just you know so we looked at it my dad's oh you know it's probably a mountain lion you know, who knows there's lots of mountains we're kind of thinking I looked out kind of over this ridge and so we do, we just figured, you know, mountain lion track or whatever, and so we start walking back to the truck, and uh, that was that. We get in the truck and and we leave, and uh, I didn't think too much of it until you know I really started thinking about you know these these creatures and what could that have possibly. I mean, it just didn't fit with anything that I had ever come into contact with, especially in that area. There's just no. There's nothing out there that looked like this. So I, you know, I, I started doing a little research and then came across your show and started listening to more and more of, of the encounters and, uh, things just started adding up. My experience and how, you know, and what had happened, it just seemed to me like these could have been dogmen. And as far as my encounter goes, I'd, I'd say that's, I think that's about it. That's that's what I can remember. Dogman prints are commonly mistaken for mountain lion prints, Joel. I know you said you're kind of fuzzy on the details of that mountain lion print, as you put it, that you found in the dirt. But I want to ask you, there's a quirky feature that mountain lion tracks have. Do you remember enough about that print that you saw in the dirt that day to recall if it did have any unusual feature to it? All I can tell you is that it, it was massive. And I was like, if that is a mountain lion, that's a big mountain lion. That is a huge mountain lion. As far as the print, I think it was kind of, you know, it's kind of a standard, kind of thinner towards the back and then kind of widened out kind of where the pad is and then kind of had like, about four bigger prints, you know, above it, kind of like a, kind of like a big cat. But um, in retrospect, I mean, I remember looking at this print, just kind of being baffled by that too. And it's funny how all this kind of comes to me after the fact. Well, I didn't know anything about dogmen, so I, I didn't know what to look for. But it's, uh, it was just a massive print. It was a big old print, and it was. It kind of, I mean, from what I know of tracks, and, and again, I've, I've never even seen them. I mean, all my time in the woods, I've never seen a mountain lion. They're kind of, they're, they're incredibly elusive, and there's, there's so few of them that you just never, you never run across them. So, I don't really know, I couldn't even really tell you exactly what a mountain lion print looks like. So, that's just what I had thought 
it may be, but as far as any real identifying features, I just couldn't tell you. The one way that you can usually use to tell whether the print you're looking at is a dogman print or a mountain lion print is the presence or absence of claw marks. In almost every case, a dogman print, more accurately I should say a canine type dogman print, is going to have visible claw marks at the end of the toes. For whatever reason, there are prints that have been found outside the size realm of what could be a mountain lion that didn't have claw marks. I can't explain that one, but if you do see a print like that and it's got visible claw marks in it, then that's a good way to tell if you're looking at a canine-type dogman print or not. To be honest, I I, I can't, I, I want to tell you the truth, so I, I can't tell you with 100% certainty that, that these had claw marks or not. I just, I don't remember. Oh, that's all right. You didn't know to look for that. That's no big deal whatsoever. I've got a laundry list of questions I want to run through here with regards to that day when you had that encounter. The first one I want to ask you is, do you think whatever threw that rock at you that day intended to hit you or just wanted to scare you off? <sighs> I would say that it just wanted to scare me off because with the speed that this rock was thrown, I just don't, I mean, it had pretty good control of that rock. <laughs> and it hit right at my feet, and, and I'm not kidding, about 100, 150 miles an hour. I mean, it it went off like a gunshot. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> you know, I was just stunned. I sat there, you know, and gave my dad this look like I need to wake up. But he just, if you didn't hear that, you need to, you need to drink more coffee or something. Cause I jumped, you know, like I said, two feet in the air and with the cover on the side of this road, it's, uh, it's, in, it, you just can't see in it. You, you can't see through the, the brush. And, um, I believe, you know, I mean, things can creep up on you real quick. I mean, it, it, there's, there's about, like I said, there's maybe a, just enough clearing to get your truck through and as you get that truck through i mean there's trees just scraping your truck and you know it's it's a real tight squeeze with real thick brush on each side so anything that wants you can have you i mean it's just you know hopefully you can you can get a shot off or sometimes people take a sidearm with them and they can you know if, if things get real nasty you can you can defend yourself but um you know, if this if this was a dog man, um, I, it it just obviously just wanted to scare me. It just wanted to scare me off. Yeah, whatever threw that rock obviously had bad intentions. If it hit that hard, that's a scary thought right there. You said the four black figures in the pre-interview. You said that they were crawling towards the blind. Can you go into more detail on that? How they were crawling in your direction? They were kind of all around the feeder and they they were kind of what was happening since we had spread corn all around the blind they were moving kind of in all directions towards us away from us around the back of the feeder um now the way they were moving was was all fours it looked like a cat the way they were i mean it, it wasn't you know, a cat will kind of go up, you know, its shoulders will kind of be moving a little more fluidly. These things seemed a little more sturdy, but incredibly graceful. They were just interested in the corn, and they were moving just very fluidly. I mean, just like they just weren't even bound by gravity. They were jumping up and over the pin like a slinky. You know, like when you see a slinky go down the stairs, I mean, it was just like, I mean, just incredibly graceful. They didn't make much of a move towards us. They were kind of coming up closer to kind of get to the corn, but again, we're 70 yards off, so they never came within 50 yards of us. But they were, they did come a little closer, um, to get some of the corn kind of up in front of the feeder, of the, of the feeder. But, um, as far as like coming towards us, they, they, they were keeping their distance for the most part. I realized the sun hadn't come up yet and these things were blacker than black as dogmen are commonly reported as being. But 
Did you ever make out any physical features on these subjects that pointed towards them being dog men? I've been trying my best to remember, and, and it was killing me that I couldn't, you know, when I was looking through that scope, because I've been able, like I said before, I've been able to identify everything I've ever seen in the woods. I mean, I, you know, you can always identify what it was, but for whatever reason, it seemed kind of, and, and the more I think about it, and I don't want to, I'm not just kind of going off in my own world here, but they did kind of seem like they were almost kind of hiding a little, you know, like they were kind of mimicking animals and that they were kind of not showing their face. I mean, I'd get them from the side and I'd see them from the back and everything, but it it was real strange because it, it did seem like, you know, they were kind of tucking their heads in, kind of like they, they, they would kind of turn and just not give you that perfect silhouette to where you could make out what the facial features were or anything like that. Now, I did see them from the side and the visibility was low, but, you know, I just know that they were kind of a flat back. Um, as far as the head goes, I just I couldn't quite make out what the head looked like. And I wish I could, but I just I can't tell you even if it had a snout or not. I just you know, it was it it, it did seem like they were kind of being careful not to give me that give me a good view of you just mentioned that they had a flat back posture. Just so I'm clear on this, you're saying their shoulders were about the same height as their rump. Yes. All right, I've got you. And I'm still a little fuzzy when you said that they seemed to be mimicking other animals. I know you said that they were trying to hide their faces, their heads apparently, but did they have any movements or any other types of actions that gave you the impression that they were trying to pretend to be some other type of animal or what? I'm not all that clear on what you meant. That's kind of what I've been kind of playing back and forth in my head is that it just, when I, when I saw it, it just seemed unnatural. The way they were moving, I've never seen anything move like that. That's what I mean by kind of mimicking animals, because it seemed, it just, I don't, you know, it, it wasn't like they were trying to mimic cats or, or mimic anything that that I can think of. It's just that they were, it was just the way they were moving. I've just never seen anything move like that, and it just seemed like if they wanted to, these things could have jumped 15 feet in the air, and I was kind of wondering why one of them didn't start climbing a tree or, you know, so it just seemed like they were keeping themselves kind of subdued and, and kind of covering up and kind of playing this kind of false role, kind of character. It just, it, it, it seemed like they, they were kind of hiding, kind of hiding something, not, not showing exactly what they were and kind of, by, you know, mimicking animals, I mean that they, they didn't seem like they, they seemed like they could have done more than what they were doing. I don't know. It's hard. It's just, it's kind of hard for me to explain. It sounds like a lot of things about what you saw that morning were very hard to explain, so don't feel bad about that. You gave us their rough dimensions, Joel. You said they were about three feet tall by about four feet long. How much would you guess they might have weighed? Uh, it, you know, it's kind of a tough call. I mean, I would say, you know, I've known some big dogs that probably weighed in the vicinity of maybe 80 to 90 pounds, maybe a little less, maybe 65 pounds. I mean, that's a big, big old dog. And I would say that these things were, they were, they, they were built a little differently. I mean, they, you know, they were built a little differently than a dog. I could, I could definitely tell it just wasn't a normal dog with the real skinny little back legs and skinny. I mean, these, seemed to have, that's why I was thinking maybe in my head, you know, maybe they were kind of bare, but then I was thinking, well, bears have big old pot bellies. You know, even baby bears have at least, you know, they're built like a little round little bear. These weren't very round. You know, it didn't have a pot belly, but it didn't have the skinny little dog legs either. I'd put them probably, at, you know, any, in it, and again, it's hard to say because of the low visibility, but I'd say anywhere from about 65 to maybe 
a little over 100 pounds apiece. If they were about three feet tall by about four feet long, that is the size of a big dog like an Irish wolfhound or a Great Dane. From what I understand, it takes a massive Great Dane to get over a four-foot length to start with, so you just might have something there. You said they disappeared right before the sun came up. After they seemed to leave the area, did you ever get the impression they might have still been around watching you? Well, I mean, you know, when, when, when I had left the blind, I knew something was watching me. I just, you know, I, I, I do that all the time where I'll, you know, and a lot of people do where you'll be standing in a, you know, a store or whatever and, and all of a sudden you just look over your right shoulder for whatever reason and some person's just staring right at you, you know, so there is that sixth sense that was going off. I mean, I, I could tell something was definitely eyeballing me, but really I was so concentrated on that spooked deer and, and this relaxed fox that I just, I wasn't thinking of anything kind of looking at me now. I, I'm always kind of like I said, we had that 360 degrees of vision. I was always kind of scanning all around just to see if there were any more of these or anything, and I, I, I didn't see anything else. So, you know, I didn't get the impression I was being watched during the hunt while we were sitting in the blind. I didn't get any kind of impression like that. But definitely when we got out of the blind and started walking back to the truck, um, yeah, that fear... That, that that was something, I mean, it was it was like a demonic kind of fear. I mean, it, it wasn't a normal, um, something's looking at you. I mean, it was something's looking at you, and it, it you may be attacked. I mean, you know, the hair on my neck was raising, and I started saying the Lord's Prayer in my heart. So I won't start doing that unless something's, uh, you know, I'm in some kind of danger. Before we get into the terror that you felt walking to the truck, there's one other question I wanted to throw at you. Through all of this, did you ever smell or hear anything strange? No. No, I didn't smell anything. I didn't hear anything. You know, we had heard coyotes, and, I, and I'm pretty sure, I can't quite remember if we heard coyotes during that hunt, but I know we had heard them the night before hunting and going crazy. But um, as far as uh, hearing anything or smelling anything, I, I didn't. Now back to the incident about the feeling of terror that you had when you were heading for the truck. When you felt that feeling of terror when you and your dad were heading for the truck, did your dad ever get that feeling, or was it just you? You know, if he did, he he probably wouldn't have said it. <laughs> That's just kind of, he's a real no-nonsense um, kind of guy, and <laughs> I had gotten back a couple days after, and I had asked him, I was like, you know, because at first, I, you know, I didn't know anything about dogmen, and, and my initial research had led me to believe that maybe these were baby Bigfoots. So I was like, you know, Dad, maybe maybe those were Bigfoot. And he just immediately was, oh, Joel, that's the dumbest thing I've ever, you know, those don't exist, and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, I, and I know how he is with that kind of stuff, and so I just dropped it, you know, I, I'm not going to, push the envelope with the Bigfoot thing with him. He's he's a real practical guy, and he's he's not going to believe anything till it sits on his face, you know. So um, I just dropped it. But, but initially, my thought was maybe that these were, were baby Bigfoot. And after further research, I'm, I'm thinking definitely that they were, they were probably dogmen. Yeah, it certainly is leaning that way, especially considering that print that you found in the dirt that seems to have been left by a dogman. We don't know that as a fact, but it sure seems to be that way. Moving on, when you first contacted me, you told me you couldn't wait to get back out into the woods. Now that you know Dogman's a reality, when you go back out there, what's going to be your main objective? Seeing one? Photographing one? Or what? You know, I, I know, you know, you, you, <laughs> I want to be smart about it. You know, um, but I also know that, that I'm going to be back out at that deer lease. And, um, you know, luckily for me, like you had told me in the pre-interview, that it wasn't a face-to-face -face with, with whatever it was that threw the rock or, you know. Um, so it was not a, a real traumatizing experience. You know, I mean, I, I did have the fear come over me that, that I was able to kind of dispel, and that was fine. But... 
um, yeah, so I started thinking, you know, I, I would, you know, initially I was thinking, well, if these things are what I think it is, and I got a few buddies I can call and that are all good with weapons and we can go out there and we can take care of whatever, <laughs> whatever's out there. Uh, after listening to some stories and especially that dog man encounters episode 21, I don't think SEAL Team 6 could, I think they'd be hard pressed to, uh, to take out one of these dog men. So I was actually thinking, you know, after, after I'd kind of put that to rest where, okay, well, I ain't no, you know, I'm no match for these things in their environment, even, even with a AR-10 and strapped up and, and battle rattle and everything like that, I'm, I'm, I'm really no match. I start thinking, well, you know, these things could have, could have done me harm. You know, they, if, if it wanted to, it could have, it could have killed me. It didn't. Why? You know, and then I started thinking, well, that deer that came out, you know, I mean, it, it was kind of seemed like that deer was pushed out. I mean, it was looking back and forth to the right, to the left, where it was pushed out. That's all I was interested in. And it kind of seemed like, it, like an offering, kind of like, well, y'all came out for deer here. Here's your deer. Shoot this deer and be gone. I mean, the more I put these pieces together, the more I'm kind of seeing the string that, you know, that runs through it. Um, so it, it started, I started thinking again, well, maybe these aren't so bad, you know, maybe whatever, you know, the, the, the mom or dad dogman that threw the rock, you know, was just trying to kind of get a read on us, kind of, kind of throw that at me, kind of see what I was, kind of test my metal or whatever. And, and just kind of wanted to get a read, and and then after it found out we're we're not so bad, it kind of wanted to maybe make contact, and and wanted to kind of you know since we had dropped all this corn, maybe it wanted to give us a deer, and and so I was thinking, well, I'd go out there and I'd drop a bunch of corn, and I'd you know I'd sit and I'd I'd try and make some kind of communication with the thing, just a an acknowledgement of each other kind of thing, that you know. Nothing more than that. I don't know if these things want their picture taken. I was going to have the respect to not not do that initially, but after talking with you and, and talking to some other people um, and the feeling I'd got, you know, that kind of demonic, horrible feeling, um, I don't think, you know, that these things <laughs> want anything to do with me. I don't know what that deer was doing being pushed out into the clearing like that i don't know if that was an offering or maybe this is just some deer that they had been chasing that just kind of had gotten caught up in this clearing and didn't know where to go because it was surrounded you know i just didn't know so i don't want to push the envelope i don't want to go in there and do something that i shouldn't be doing because that's just stupid if you know i, I need to be careful too if, if i if, you know if i want to walk the path i i got to tread lightly and, and watch my step and I'm not trying to get into some kind of altercation with these things if I see one again out at the lease then I see one and that's fine I'll I'll pray and, and hopefully I'll get over it <laughs> um, I, I love hunting and that's being in the woods and, and just being one with nature and not hearing any cars I mean when you're out in the middle of 3,000 acres and, and all you, you can hear a pin drop it's just beautiful. It's you just the air's fresh. I mean, it's just beautiful. There's just no possible way I'm I'm gonna be kept from my woods. And I know I can promise you, my family, uh, they're not going anywhere either. So, <laughs> um, if if I see one in the future, you know, I, I I am intrigued by these creatures. You know, if, if that's what I saw, you know, I, who, you know, in a safe setting, I, think, I don't know if I've heard you say this or, or someone, but, you know, I, I'd love to see one in some kind of super cage where I'm completely protected and, you know, a hundred yards out and this cage is, you know, built for like a T-Rex or, you know, something like that. That, that'd be cool. Seeing one face to face could be an entirely different story. And, and to be honest, I don't know how I would react. I, I've had a little experience. I think I I know I would, you know, I would kind of go into myself and I'd pray and, and just kind of keep moving. But then again, I don't know. So, I, you know, it's kind of this, I am excited. I don't know if it's a good, smart thing, but I am kind of excited to get back out there. 
and uh, maybe, you know, see something. But, um, you know, we'll just see how that goes. I mean, if, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. You know, there's just no... And on my trajectory, if, if you knew me and the people that know me and my brain, I'm pretty hard-headed. I mean, I just... I've got reason to be, you know, I, I, um, I've done a lot on my own and, you know, I'm, I'm not scared of much anymore. You know, I, death doesn't frighten me, you know, it, um, you know, if, if it's your time to go, if it's written in the book, then, it, then it's your time to go. So I know that'd be a horrific way to go, but that's not going to stop me. You know, Joel, towards the end of the pre-interview, I remember how you told me about your intentions on heading back out to the Lees and doing some more hunting. And I also remember how the hair in my butt stood up when you told me about doing that because I got the impression that you didn't have any appreciation for the potential danger you might be putting yourself in by doing that. But after sitting here listening to you talk about it, I get the impression that you do have an appreciation for how dangerous that might be. Yeah. Um, something that can move like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a very dangerous, you know, you're dealing with some kind of animal, some kind of cryptid that, uh, that we don't know about that, um, has a higher intelligence than most animals. I mean, if the way these were acting, covering up. So you're dealing with something that, that is more intelligent than a normal animal has all the skills of an animal in the woods and uh, is far more athletic, agile, and elusive than, than anything we've ever seen. So we really don't know what we're going up against. And that I respect. I like to think I could get my rifle up and I could put a bead on something and, and shoot within... I could identify a target put the bead at center mass, pull the trigger really quick, quicker than, I mean, I could do it about as quickly as I can identify something, the gun's up in position, and I can shoot, and and I, I'm confident, I'm 100% confident in that, but when you're walking through these woods, and you, you can't see what's behind you or on the side of you, there's just, there's no time to even get your gun up. I mean, it's, you know, it, it would, it, it'd be all over before you knew what happened. So, I mean, I, I think that'd be the, the maybe the one positive about it is I, a lot of people have been saying, you know, death by dog man would be, would probably be the worst death. And I, and I agree. I'm sure that, you know, that's definitely no way to go, but I bet it'd be over pretty quick. <laughs> I bet that thing probably just run by and knock my head off and that'd be that. I, I don't think, you know, it, you know, who knows? I don't think they'd drag me back to some camp and torture me or anything like that. So, you know, I think there are worse things. You know, I, th I think it'd probably be over pretty quick. Not that I'd want that to happen, but yeah, yeah, I have a whole lot of, a lot of respect for these the more I uh, look into it. You know, every time I turn around, I've got a new person telling me about how they would love to head out into their local woods and try and seek out an encounter with one of these things. As I've put out there before, it just drives me crazy when I have people tell me that. It's almost like they have no appreciation for how dangerous something like that could be. But I am glad, having said all that, that it seems like you do see the light on that now and have no qualms about how dangerous seeking out an encounter would be. Well, when, when I go out next time, I'll be scanning the tree line and, and doing what I can do, but at the end of the day... I, and like you said, I'm, I'm not going to try and, and draw these things towards me. I'll keep an eye out. If I see one, whatever, great. You know, I mean, that, you know, that'll be that. But I don't think I, you know, need to provoke anything. And, and since we're going to be down there, um, forever, <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't, I don't need to, uh, get in any kind of altercation. I don't need to rot, you know, to, God forbid I shoot one and, and I've, I've heard your show where that can just, you know, they can seek revenge. I, I don't, I don't want anything like that. And, and the more I learn about them, the more I do respect and, and appreciate uh, the danger therein. You know, I, I know that, that if these things want you dead, there's really nothing you can do. Isn't that the truth? Something I want to put out there, these things without a doubt, 
They're so at home in the woods, they could take you out at will, which you alluded to earlier on in the interview here. If they want to take you out, whether you have a gun or not, it would be just so easy for them to do that. Because of what I do, I've got the ability to talk with people who have had multiple encounters with these things. Encounters seemingly on almost a regular basis. From talking to people with experiences like that, several different people with their own encounters, their own opinions to share with me on how dogmen like to do certain things, it's my opinion that dogmen that don't want you to know that they're there are going to try and position themselves behind you when you're out in their area. They can do that in two different ways. They can either let you walk past them and then take up a position behind you, or if you're static in the woods, they can just use cover to position themselves behind you in whatever means. Just because you don't see the dog man, that doesn't mean that there's not one in the area. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share, Joel? I just maybe like to encourage everybody that if you are one of those people like I had initially been that, that thought, you know, well, let's get out there with some high powered rifles and, and <laughs> see what this is all about. Um, I definitely would, would uh, warn against that. I think, um, like you're saying right now, you just, you're, you know, we're no match. We're no match for them. We need to know our place. Hearing some, some tales of the Native Americans, you're talking about some of the bravest warriors this planet has ever seen in, in the Native American people. And when you hear about what they have to say about these things, they say, leave them alone. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to follow that advice and, and, you know, I'm not going to lie. I, I, there's a part of me that wants to see a dog, man. I think a lot of people can understand that, but I think if, if you're destined to see a dog, man, then you'll see a dog, man. I don't think you need to go out and look for one though. I, I think that, uh, these things have been left alone for centuries for a good reason. And, um. And I, you know, I think it, it should, it should, it should stay that way. I, I, you know, until we find out more, uh, we just don't know what we're up against. So, uh, I'd encourage everyone to be safe and, and, uh, keep the Lord in your heart and just, uh, carry on. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and sharing those bits of info and that story with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Vic. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks again. Have a great night, okay? I will. I'll talk to you later. All right, Vic. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter and you'd like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, you can reach me at contact at dogmanencounters.com. I'd love to hear from you. Mm-hmm.